All right. Welcome to the Ken Worthy Performing Arts Center. I am Haley Noble, the Latah County Historical Society curator. We are here for the last installment of How It's Going, How It Started, uh, which we began in the fall, and we are happy to see that it ran through the spring and we had such a great turnout. Uh, support for this program is provided by the Idaho Humanities Council and Washington State University. We are pleased to have Dr. Sean Wempe here. He is, let's see, Dr. Sean Wempe is an assistant professor of modern European history at California State University, Bakersfield. Wempe completed his doctorate at Emory University in 2015 and worked at Washington State University in the Roots of Contemporary Issues program until 2018, when he landed his tenure track job at Cal State Bakersfield. Wempe specialized in the history of imperialism, internationalism, and the history of public health. His first book, Revenants of the German Empire, Colonial Germans, Imperialism, and the League of Nations was released with Oxford University Press in 2019. He has also published three articles on the topic of German imperialism and the League of Nations mandate system. His second book, which is the subject of today's talk, was The Chronic Disparities, Public Health and Historical Perspective, which it was also published through Oxford University Press in 2020. That text surveys the history of the deployment of public health initiatives around the world exploring the societal factors and events that influence its development and the cultural, political, religious, demographic, and economic impact these, first, these practices have had on inequalities of race, class, and gender in an increasingly globalizing society. <laughs> Wempy is also a content editor building a curriculum for primary and secondary students in the European Union on the history of pandemics as part of the Historiana project. As soon as he's able to travel after the pandemic, he intends to resume work on his third book project on German and British interference in League of Nations international narcotics regulations in the 1920s and 30s, as well as articles on League of Nations efforts to combat rinderpest, malaria, and sleeping sickness in the mandates in Africa in the same decades. So please welcome Dr. Sean Wempe. Thank you very much for that lovely introduction. Um, welcome everybody. Uh, thanks for coming out to the Ken Worthy. Um, as Haley mentioned, um, I got my doctorate at Emory University. Those of you who don't know, it's in Atlanta, Georgia, and it's right next door to the CDC. Uh, which kind of started this early love affair with public health and addition to my history interests, as well as some experiences there, like being put on a ventilator during the last pandemic in the 2009 flu, and then experiencing the Ebola controls that Emory was a part of trying to treat patients there. So I developed a real passion for this subject. Uh, and one of the things that became really apparent over the years and what all of us have experienced in the last two years is that not only in the history of public health, but specifically the history of pandemics, um, any inequalities in a society get pretty exacerbated in those circumstances. Um, so society's pre-existing conditions get worse when a pandemic emerges. And that's sort of the subject of tonight's talk um, that I'm gonna go over with you tonight. And apologies, I'll be mostly glued to the platform to stick near the mic. Um, so one of the big things that I always tell my students and I want members of the public and everybody to, to know about pandemics is the typical way we view of them as the myth that pandemics are equalizers, that they impact everyone the same way, rich, poor, young, old, disease doesn't care. It's like this Bruegel painting where everybody's dead or dying in the streets. That's largely sort of a Hollywood or mythologized version of pandemics. Uh, pandemics are, by their very nature, social, which means everything about them exacerbates things that are already going on in the society. Um, so those who are experiencing the most inequality and the most disparity in a community, they're going to experience the pandemic in a very different way. It's going to be an amplification of what they're experiencing. Uh, and that's true for a lot of different inequalities in society. 
Some examples here, and the one I'm going to focus on primarily today is racism during pandemics uh, with historical examples, but this is not an exhaustive list, but there are some examples here. Racism is one uh, that pandemics tend to exacerbate. I'll go into more detail later. Ableism, so preferences for neurotypical, physiotypical uh, folks without pre-existing conditions. There's a lot of prejudice against those who don't have that benefit in a pandemic, and their situation is also made worse during a pandemic, typically. Uh, ageism, so we heard a lot early on, about, oh, the pandemic's only affecting people who are over a certain age, uh, which was clearly a sort of discriminatory mindset as if those lives were valued somewhat less. As a result, it was used as a calming mechanism. And that's common during pandemics as well. Gender disparities run rampant in pandemics from societal expectations to sometimes disparities in who's impacted by the disease or access to healthcare. Depending on the disease, homophobia and transphobia can be an issue, such as with diseases like HIV. Um, stigmas surrounding those communities can emerge and be uh, reinforced and exacerbated. A big one that we normally don't think about too much because we tend to think of it as a separate issue is food insecurity. But given the last two years experiencing all the supply chain disruptions that we've faced, um, food insecurity is something that's definitely exacerbated by pandemics. Uh, whether it's because of the controls uh, put in place to control the disease or because of a loss of labor pool, uh, famines can frequently go hand in hand with pandemic, and that can be a major problem. And lastly, economic inequality is another example. Again, this list is not exhaustive, uh, but you can probably think of some examples of all of these in the last two years having lived through a pandemic. But a lot of people who've never lived through a pandemic or an epidemic still have that mythologized view that it's gonna sweep through and impact everybody the same way. And that's just not how it functions. And it, it's never really functioned that way in history. Um, one I wanna focus on tonight is racism and pandemics. And there's a couple of ways in which this gets reinforced uh, during a pandemic disease event. Racial inequalities routinely create disparities in access to care in communities even before pandemics emerge, which means targeted populations who are already segregated or discriminated against become more vulnerable to the lethal effects of an illness as it sweeps through a community. Additionally, uh, another key one that happens fra fairly frequently with pandemics is association of one ethnic or racial group with the disease. And so you get a stigmatization of that group uh, even dehumanizations of those groups because of their association with the disease that can lead to violence and very negative outcomes for those communities. Uh, some examples that we're going to look at today, others that we're not. Uh, one is singling out Haitians as a risk group during the HIV AIDS pandemic. We're going to talk about that one today. Uh, one that strikes a little bit closer to COVID is the association of Asian populations with the 1968 flu pandemic also known as at the time as the Hong Kong flu, uh, which generated a lot of the same anti-Asian sentiments that we've seen during COVID as well. Uh, and also uh, racist violence directed towards Africans and those of African descent during the 2014 to 2016 Ebola crisis, which was not a pandemic, but a major health event globally. So the ways this plays out uh, with racism in a pandemic, there's a couple of terms to, to keep in mind. Uh, one that's coined by Paul Farmer, who is a great medical anthropologist who sadly passed away recently in Rwanda, uh, is the geography of blame. Uh, the association of a disease as being from a locale and stigmatization of that region and peoples from it, which can also lead to the color of blame, associating a specific group with the disease. Uh, that's leads to stigma and violence against those groups pretty regularly. Uh, it can also reinforce already existing racist prejudices within the healthcare industry uh, about those groups. Uh, we have to remember that medical professionals are also products of their historical context. So frequently, they have some of the same stereotypes and prejudices as the general public, uh, and sometimes different kinds uh, regarding communities and their susceptibility to illness or their proclivity uh, towards conditions that would lead to the disease. Uh, and so those racist preconceptions can alter and negatively impact care on a regular basis. Uh, and then 
as I mentioned before, that lack of access to care routinely leads to more negative outcomes uh, for minority groups in a population. The historical examples I'm gonna go through today, it's three examples that I'm gonna focus on over nine pandemics. I'm not gonna go into detail on all seven of the cholera pandemics. That's all one category. So the seven pandemics of cholera, Vibrio cholerae is a bacterial infection, leads to some very pleasant symptoms like extreme diarrhea that leads to such severe dehydration that the circulatory system and organs can fail. Um, the third pandemic of plague, yes, that plague, Again, a bacterial infection. Same one is in the Black Death, but this is a different period uh, that we're looking at. Uh, and then the HIV AIDS pandemic, which is an ongoing one. So we're actually living through two pandemics right now. This more episodic one with COVID, but this sort of long, uh, long running one with AIDS since the 80s. With cholera, the seven pandemics of cholera, particularly the fourth, fifth, and sixth, were especially detrimental to the poor, colonized subjects and immigrant groups in places like Britain, the United States, Germany, the Ottoman Empire, and their colonial and other territorial holdings uh, nearby or overseas. Um, this was the result of already heavily drastic inequalities embedded into these societies in terms of urban planning in the industrial era, which segregated populations based on class, uh, labor, uh, as well as race, especially in the colonial context, uh, which led to inadequate infrastructure in those regions that were deemed the bad parts of town, right? In those racist preconceptions and classist preconceptions. Uh, so poor functioning sewers, poor running water led to more frequent outbreaks of the disease in those communities and an association of those communities with the disease as a result, even though it's based on these long running systemic inequalities. It's not like the disease suddenly popped up there. Um, responses frequently blamed the poor. Uh, racial minorities, one of the oldest uh, blames fell on colonized subjects, uh, crafting a racialized narrative of the disease pretty early on in the 19th century. Um, that racialized narrative in the British context largely begins in the early 19th century, uh, starting in 1817 with the expansion of British colonial conquest into India. Uh, British East India Company's uh, advancements during what was known as the Pindari War or the Third anglo maratha War uh, from 1817 to 1825, which coincided with a regional outbreak of cholera uh, the disease is thought to be endemic to India, uh, and there was an outbreak going on in Jusore, which is in Bengal, India, at the time when these military campaigns began. Uh, as a result of conquest, and we're seeing this firsthand again uh, with things like Ukraine right now, conflict can severely damage infrastructure, cause all sorts of societal disruptions that will ultimately lead to outbreaks of disease. Um, so that's why the World Health Organization, for instance, is very concerned about the situation in Ukraine right now. There's a lot of historical evidence for that. This is a perfect example of that. Uh, following troop movements, the disease spread across India. Uh, it expanded into other countries in Asia as well and evolved into uh, that first real major pandemic of cholera. Uh, so we already get this racialized narrative building from it because of the British soldiers associated with the East India Tea Company, uh, as tens of thousands died in India, the British soldiers are writing in their journals and diaries uh, and blaming the indigenous population, Indians. Uh, one example is a quote from a, a marquee in the region. He blamed it on the quote, poor hygiene of the Pindari creatures, end quote which starts a structure of a racialized narrative about the disease. We see de dehumanization, referring to people as creatures, more animalistic, uh, noting that their behavior is the reason, poor hygiene, uh, based on a Western standard of hygiene at this point. So it's already setting up this discriminatory pattern uh, that's gonna come into play as Britain expands its control into the colonial sphere in India, and then has to regulate cholera uh, not only back home during pandemics, but also in its colonies. Um, and there's some stark differences between how cholera is managed 
in Britain versus how it's handled in India. Uh, Britain itself has a largely classist narrative centered around Chadwick and the sanitarian movement, which would be another talk for another time. Uh, but ultimately, there are major infrastructural improvements made in Britain to control cholera. Massive changes to sewer systems, running water systems, uh, and protocols put in place to control outbreaks of the disease in the future. These same techniques are not put into place in India. Uh, the rhetoric of the British colonial officials when they're pushed by British uh, doctors or Indian medical trainees who are not allowed to be full doctors for quite some time in the colonial realm, but then eventually do. Uh, when those individuals argue to the colonial officials, we need to engage in some of these same infrastructure improvements to control the disease in India. Uh, those running the colony poo-poo that and say, no, the disease is, quote, unique to India. It is due to, quote, local influence, end quote, and there is nothing we can do about it as a result. So they use it as a cop-out uh, to avoid the expense of uh, modifying the society in a way that would curtail the disease. There's also a commercial motive because one of the protocols that would be put in place uh, that is internationally pushed for, especially after the Istanbul Sanitarian Conference is quarantine and locking down ports to cease the spread of the disease. India is the jewel in the empire. It's one of the most profitable ones. That's out. Uh, there are health societies in India that are tied in, in Britain that are tied to investment in India. They poo-poo those uh, recommendations on a regular basis. Um, government officials also poo-poo it. Uh, so even when there are medical professionals like MC Fernell, who I'll show a little bit on the next slide of his work, um, trying to push for these societal transformations that are needed to mitigate the spread of the disease, they're silenced pretty quickly um, and regularly. So true relief does not really come until after independence with the introduction of, at first, very simplistic infrastructural changes like water pumps like Mark II and Mark III, uh, which supply a more ready stream of clean water um, and other changes that'll come in the form of aid packages and medical improvements over time. Uh, seen here is a very long quote. This is a, um, a note that MC Fresnel publishes uh, speaking out against British colonial government's refusal to address the real source of the problem. And he talks about how many times he hears people say, can nothing be done to solve this problem? You can see that in the quote over there. And he says, I routinely answer, yes, if the authorities would see that the people were provided with pure and uncontaminated water supply, the cholera would disappear from India as it has many parts elsewhere. Uh, and so he seeks to try and encourage people to engage in this, um, but every time he runs into this argument that cholera is not spread by human intercourse or contaminated water, but is due to quote, local influence, by which they mean it's indigenous to India, Indians have cholera, nothing we can really do about it. So again, it's a cop out to avoid it by pegging the disease with this group. This also takes place in the United States, even though cholera deaths nowhere near what India is gonna face in these pandemics. Uh, it also faces a large number of waterborne illnesses like typhoid, dysentery uh, on a regular basis. And often uh, one of the standards for Americans is to blame disease on immigrant populations. Uh, we've seen this pattern play out in our own lifetimes, many of us on a regular basis, uh, seeing political pundits make such commentary uh, and politicians themselves. But it, it's got a long tradition here as evidenced by this quite famous political cartoon, which is ironically also uh, developed by an immigrant, but an Austrian immigrant uh, with an antagonism towards Eastern European and Southeastern European uh, migrants to the United States. You can see that the figure, which is basically an anthropomorphism of death, uh, has cholera written on his belt, uh, is dressed in a stereotypical Southeast European garb, bridging Ottoman and Eastern European uh, 
and it says the kind of assisted immigrant we cannot afford to admit. Uh, now there is some association of the British with this disease uh, because of their refusal to engage in blockade ports and quarantine of ports, but there's still this huge racist anti-immigrant message as a component here. Um, this xenophobia is, be, uh, is a part of a much larger pattern of blaming immigrants for disease, especially groups like uh, Chinese, Japanese, Korean migrants, Jewish migrants, Eastern European migrants, uh, and Mexican migrants uh, that leads to some pretty horrific policies, especially at places like the southern border where these individuals will be forced to take kerosene baths uh, before even being allowed to enter the United States as a way to rid them of any pestilence. Uh, I don't know about you, but bathing in kerosene does not seem very pleasant and is essentially a form of torture, I would say. Um, this has persisted well past the 19th century. Uh, as I said, we still see this on a regular basis when there was all that talk of that massive caravan uh, coming to the border. They were bringing with them all sorts of deadly diseases. And then even though COVID was more deadly uh, in the United States because of our own behavior, there's a lot of rhetoric about immigrants being the cause of COVID coming into the country. So it's a routine pattern in, in U.S. history that seems to come up, especially with disease. Um, the next pandemic I want to talk about, we're getting away from cholera now, and we're going to talk about plague. Uh, the third pandemic of plague uh, lasted from 1855 to 1945. What we think of as the Black Death was one episode within the second pandemic of plague. Uh, this one is the first time that plague reaches uh, North and South America uh, in the New World and now is still endemic in rodent populations in California, where I came from. So, joy. Uh, <laughs> Lots of little plague carriers. That's why I like coyotes, they eat them. Um, so uh, you can see here, uh, there's an association. This, this is coming from outside. And that makes sense because the disease hadn't existed in the New World yet. Definitely coming from outside. This is a still from a 1940s educational film about the plague spreads to America. Unfortunately, no copy of the film exists, but we do have descriptions of other slides. Uh, this slide, uh, the next one in the animation contained racist caricatures of various Asian faces, which unfortunately that one was destroyed. That would be a much better still to show here, but that one does no, it no longer survives. Uh, the suspected origin of the pandemic, its starting point this time was Yunnan, China, which led to a lot of unfair associations of the disease with Asian populations around the world. Um, Chinese and Japanese, as well as Korean immigrants, were already facing a fair amount of discrimination in places like Europe and the United States, largely due to already existing stereotypes and prejudices, uh, especially those relating to the opium trade, uh, which was, again, another unfair association at the time uh, with that group that had led to a lot of very racist urban planning and very harsh immigration policies in these areas leading to these populations largely being confined to sections of town that became known as Chinatowns that had poor infrastructure, uh, less than subpar housing, uh, and frequently had situations where there was an influx of rodents. Uh, this is due to systemic problems with the urban planning of these periods, uh, not necessarily anything these populations themselves are doing to exacerbate the problem, but they are becoming more susceptible because rats uh, and their fleas, mainly the fleas are one of the key vectors uh, for this disease. So they face it on a, at a higher rate in a lot of places, whether it's in French Indochina in that colony, which also has segregated cities uh, like Hanoi at the time, or places like Honolulu, San Francisco, or San Diego. Uh, this leads to a lot of violence against these populations, evictions, uh, beatings, and then also efforts by public health officials themselves to clean the area of pests, uh, frequently through fire, uh, burning derelict structures. Uh, and so uh, one such example is in Honolulu, what was proposed as a controlled burn to remove rubbish uh, that had led to an influx of rodents 
led to a 38 acre conflagration that took out most of Chinatown and Honolulu and beyond. Um, at the time, it's indicated this may have been an accident, but then there's others, other documents that indicate that even once they knew the fire was out of control, officials said, let it burn. Uh, and no effort was made to contain it until it started to bleed into other areas, wealthier areas, whiter areas of town. Um, and this led to a lot of shift in property uh, over time and uh, Chinese migrants moving away from the city to other areas. Similar patterns take place in San Diego and San Francisco in 1900. And this is coming in the wake of already pretty heavy uh, uh, discrimination in the form of things like the 1882 Chinese Exclusion Act. Um, it's not long after that. So we see this pattern, racism already exists. The pandemic exacerbates those problems that are already existing for this racial minority. And they're also having worse outcomes because they're being exposed to the disease more frequently as a result of the urban planning. Another example pings back to India. Uh, the third pandemic of plague, India is hit the hardest. India has a lot of historical bad luck with pandemics. It never seems to catch a break. Uh, largely due to its very high population density, which creates a lot of public health planning logistical problems. Uh, but that was especially true in the height of the third pandemic of plague. Now remember, it lasted almost a century, that pandemic. Uh, so it would have said, hold my beer to COVID in some ways. But uh, this one, uh, the worst years uh, for the globe were 1896 to 1921. And in that time, India lost an estimated 12 million lives to this disease, whereas the rest of the world lost an estimated 3 million. That's a pretty large disparity. Uh, part of the problem here is British mismanagement of the colony. Uh, you can see here, this is a quarantine camp in Karachi. A lot of the cities in India that had uh, both white settler populations and uh, indigenous Indian populations were fairly segregated populations. One of the complaints is the increased rodent population in the more derelict parts of town, again, because of poor urban planning. And the solution that's proposed by colonial officials at the time is forced mass migrations of Indians to quarantine camps, like the one shown here from 1897. This is a former military stables that's repurposed as a camp uh, which will house uh, thousands of individuals during this. Um, these themselves will also have a massive rodent problem uh, at the time. Uh, and because British officials already associate cholera as a local problem, they're not doing anything to mitigate that either. Um, so there's no effort to control human waste, which means cholera and typhus are also gonna spread like wildfire in these camps exacerbating the problem. On top of that, uh, you have a series of famines emerging. The third pandemic of plague is creating labor shortages in the region. On top of that, a huge amount of the arable land has been transformed into poppy agriculture uh, for the opium trade. And so that's exacerbating the problem as the population is malnourished and therefore more susceptible uh, to worse outcomes of disease, less likely to uh, heal up. Uh, so again, very negative outcome here uh, based off of already existing systemic problems in the society. We see it again uh, in Argentina and Brazil. And this one I like using as an example right now because the original claims of the Argentinian and Brazilian government was there is no plague. Plague does not exist here. It is merely heat sickness or it is not true plague. So they're in denial for a good long while. But then, once they can't deny it anymore, uh, they start pinning it on Afro-Argentinians and Afro-Brazilians. These societies are heavily segregated between a largely white European descent community in major cities like Rio um, uh, and a darker Afro-Brazilian or Afro-Argentinian or mixed race population in other parts of the city. The same disparities and conditions that we see in the Indian colonial planning, the French Indochina colonial planning in Hanoi, uh, 
The U.S. with the Chinatowns exist here as well. These are the more derelict portions of town. They're already subject to a fair amount of increased policing uh, in this region. Um, and they take it to uh, an extreme during the pandemic. So they have different protocols for different parts of town. Movement of Afro-Argentinian and Afro-Brazilians in both states is restricted, um, whereas the white wealthier populations can move about the city freely. Uh, so this hurts their income. Um, their houses are being torn down, burned. Uh, rat hunting is forcing people out of their homes as uh, officials go in to clear the area of rodents. Uh, if they resist to these, they're beaten. And this leads to a lot of distrust with government and public health officials in these cities. As a result, this leads to even more negative outcomes for this population in both uh, nation states when a vaccine is deployed, half teams vaccine, uh, which is a no longer used vaccine for plague, um, doesn't have a great success rate, but it's one that has some moderate success early on. It's offered and then mandated for this population and this population alone. But they refuse to take the vaccine because they don't trust these officials anymore. Uh, and then when they resist the vaccine, they are beaten uh, and imprisoned and confined. Uh, and so even more negative outcomes emerge as a result of that loss of trust in government and public health officials because of the already existing racist structures in the society. The last one I'm gonna talk about tonight is HIV AIDS. We tend to associate this one with one of the other big stereotypes that emerges in the 80s. Uh, the negative attitude towards gay men and homosexuality uh, in this period, largely driven by the Reagan administration and a lot of other communities in the United States and abroad uh, during this time period. Um, the first confirmed cases at the time that they know about are in Los Angeles and New York in 1981. They find other cases that predate those later retroactively, but at the time these decisions are being made, that's what they know is the point of origin is these two major US cities. Yet, the following year in 1982, a massive outbreak occurs in a Haitian migrant community in Miami, Florida. Yeah, Florida. Um, this uh, ultimately leads in 1983 to the CDC developing what it calls its four H's uh, as the risk groups for um, HIV AIDS, who's most likely to have it. And they label it as the four H's, homosexual men, heroin addicts, hemophiliacs, and Haitians. So we're gonna focus in on that last group. Uh, blaming Haitians uh, is building off of a already long running stereotype of the island as a promiscuous, promiscuous sexual paradise, which have been built up in the tourism industry in the United States objectifying Haiti for a number of years. Uh, and so that's building in. Uh, there's claims that there's a quote, thriving gay culture on the island and that's why the disease is there. And then there's assumptions and arguments by medical professionals and medical journals before these articles even get peer reviewed, they're published, arguing that the disease originated from Haiti. And these are coming out in the eighties. These doctors are claiming that it emerged as a result of the quote, primitive islands history of voodoo, end quote. Uh, quote, the ingestion of pig blood, end quote. And that's trying to explain how it moved into the human population. Uh, so we get a lot of major stereotypes, uh, racist images of this region and people from it, uh, labeling them as a risk group and accentuating already existing stereotypes and prejudices in the community. Um, American portrayals of Haitians accusing them of promiscuity and deviancy uh, emerged en masse uh, and then portrayed this group as a threat to public health. Uh, Haitians didn't take this quietly. They pushed back uh, both on the island nation of Haiti and also immigrants in the United States uh, were quite angry at the racist caricatures in the US media that portrayed them as this is a quote, uh, 
scantily clad black natives dancing frenetically about ritual fire or Haitians with AIDS as illegal aliens interned in detention camps, end quote. So very negative portrayals. Um, obviously Haitians do not fit that image or stereotype. Uh, and so they were quite angry and pushed back. And some even go so far as to suggest that uh, they get so distrustful of public health that they start engaging in conspiracy theories uh, that the US introduced the disease as an imperialist plot. So that's another thing that can happen with these racist stereotypes bleeding into the community, creating so much distrust for public health as it uses those preconceptions to make policy decisions, you get more susceptibility from those groups to disinformation, which is gonna result in more negative outcomes for those groups and not do anything to ratchet down the discourse and the dialogue to get to a more productive uh, public health mitigation strategy. Um, you can see here a protest uh, in 1990 uh, about the ban on blood donations from Haitians, uh, which still is partially in effect. Uh, it's been rescinded and restored and rescinded, restored numerous times. Uh, and it's all dating back to 1983 uh, with this. Uh, this gets really bad in the United States. There's a fair amount of violence against Haitian migrants across the country. Uh, especially in places like New York, uh, employers are firing Haitian employees from their jobs, landlords are evicting them, uh, concerned that they're spreading the disease in their tenements. Uh, beatings occur on a regular basis. Federal and state penitentiaries start segregating the populations in the prison uh, as a result, we're resulting in worse conditions for prisoners of Haitian uh, background. Uh, as they get less food, less medical care during those segregated periods in the prison. Uh, some examples of vandalism and racism coming into play in 1983, Brooklyn. I'm not gonna repeat some of these words, but Haitians equal blanks with AIDS. Um, quote, hire a Haitian, help spread AIDS, end quote. Quote, there were no AIDS in the USA until the illegal criminal Haitian dogs came, end quote. So some pretty hateful uh, xenophobic language uh, that's getting much more violent in its rhetoric uh, over time. It gets so bad that by 1984 in New York, they had to establish a special commission, uh, the AIDS Discrimination Unit, to address a devastating number of discriminatory practices and hate crimes against the risk groups, uh, especially against gay men and Haitians in New York. Um, that had gone through several uh, reiterations. Uh, Haitian children were being beat up. In at least one case, one was shot by 1984 at school. Haitian store owners uh, had gone bankrupt as their businesses failed and Haitian families had been evicted from their homes. In 1987, uh, the Helms Amendment uh, was introduced to supplement an already active executive order from Ronald Reagan in 1981, executive order 12324 which had allowed the Coast Guard to forcibly detain and deport Haitian migrants. Uh, what was added to this was HIV AIDS as a list of diseases that precluded immigration into the United States, a restriction that rain, remained in place for more than 20 years. Uh, so over the next few, several administrations, uh, Haitian immigrants were forcibly de detained and sent to places like Guantanamo Bay. Uh, this is an image uh, of Haitian immigrants detained for HIV positive status in Guantanamo Bay. Uh, this image is from 1993, so under the Clinton administration. So it starts under Reagan, it doesn't end uh, for quite some time. Uh, by 93, there were 215 HIV positive Haitians held in Guantanamo Bay, along with 52 of their relatives and dependents. Um, all this despite the fact that by 1985, the CDC had already reversed its decision about Haitians as a risk group. By 1985, they dropped Haitians from the 4-H group as scientists were, quote, no longer able to justify including them on statistical grounds. In 1985, of the total 9,405 cases in the US, only 285 were Haitians. That's a very small number to label them as a key risk group statistically. 
uh, accounting for less, uh, around 3% of all reported cases. Uh, Walter Dowdle, who was the director of the Center for Infectious Diseases at the time, admitted that Haitian immigrants were, quote, the only risk group that were identified because of who they were rather than what they did, uh, implying that the other groups were identified for different behaviors, which is not much better in several circumstances, but uh, this one's clearly a, a racist categorization that emerged that the CDC backtracks, but it leaves lasting policy effects and last, lasting societal impressions. So even when the science is corrected, uh, the damage is done. Uh, if it was already founded on a preconception that was flawed, once it gets out into the general public, you can't put the cat back in the bag. Uh, it's gonna keep running rampant. Um, and with that, I will probably leave it there to leave time for questions rather than dive in with some more examples of the other types of uh, historical examples of problems exacerbated by pandemics. Uh, but I'll open it up now to, to questions, uh, if anyone has one uh, or two, um, and I'm happy to answer those. Um, and Haley, is it okay to move away from the mic a little bit for the questions? Oh, thank you. Hopefully I didn't break that. No worries. Um, and then if we do get questions from the audience, if you could repeat them so then people could hear it. Yeah. In the computer. Any questions? Yes. Uh, uh, yes and no. Uh, what health risk is actually one of the ones about considering the role of the Senate and quality of life? If you look at the comments by a lot of key public health officials that have been in the pandemic, they were talking about the problems of inequality in communities, lack of access to care, racism as key problems that need to be addressed to make sure that outcomes aren't as negative. But they're not gaining much ground because the public is not necessarily putting in a pressure on politicians who also see it differently. The public health officials have learned some, uh, but society as a whole is a mixed bag. Uh, and we see some of those clear examples. So uh, for folks at home, the question was, have we learned anything? Oh, sorry. I forgot to repeat the <laughs> pandemic. That yeah. question. That's OK. Uh, the question was, or answer was yes and no. Yes and no. Yes and no. <laughs> yeah, yes and no. Uh, I'm probably loud enough to make it to that from here. Uh, what? Go back to the mic. No walking around. OK. Yeah, it's taped to the floor, so I'll be glued. Uh, OK. Uh, I saw a hand over here, this gentleman. So, yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Uh, unfortunately, historians are not great with predicting the future, uh, but if past is prologue, uh, societal supply chain disruptions can last a long time after the episodic event of a pandemic. Uh, it can stretch on for quite some time. And right now we've got other variables at play too, like a massive conflict that's disrupting 30% of the world's grain. Uh, so that's gonna be a major problem as well. Um, so probably not uh, if, if past is prologue on that. Any other questions? Yeah. Not, I don't think you can see this, but Idaho right now is the center of the, our current pandemic. New York Times, one day, blasting bread out of Idaho, right? You've seen it. Okay. So our image across this country right now is we're the center of COVID. You think that will carry forward into a bias and prejudice against people who live here or who travel from here? That's a, that's a good question. It is going to lead to some very negative outcomes for communities that did not engage in a lot of mitigation strategies. There's going to be long-term consequences. So healthcare infrastructure in a lot of rural communities was already in bad shape. It's going to continue to be taxed further 
uh, by the long running conditions that COVID could create. So that's one way that it can continue to disrupt communities long after. Uh, as far as the stereotype and prejudice um, against the region, maybe, maybe not. Uh, sometimes society has a short memory when it comes to regional variations in a pandemic, um, but it is gonna have very negative consequences for those communities that were hit hard, because uh, it's gonna have long-term consequences for those individuals that survived it as well which is going to continue to strain healthcare infrastructure. Yeah, Haley. Um, from your lecture, it looks like more recent health crises, there has been increased mistrust within public health officials. Do we see that pre, you know, 1950 or whatever, or is that purely a recent thing? It's a long running thing. So the question was, do we see distrust in public health officials before 1950? Yes. Uh, so the third pandemic of plague is an example that's in the 19th and early 20th century, uh, but even further back, there's, there's distrust, uh, especially when the public's not well informed by public health, when public health doesn't apply the same principles and practices to all members of the population, does a differential approach. Uh, sometimes that's a, a good strategy, but normally not because um, it can lead to a, a lot of distrust in the community. So another example from the third pandemic of plague, again, involves the uh, Asian immigrant population in the United States in San Francisco. Uh, San Francisco's public health commissioner had put in place very restrictive controls for the Chinese population in town. They could not move about town freely. They could not leave town. Uh, they had to get the vaccine. Uh, I'm not poo-pooing vaccine. I'm just arguing about the, the differential protocols. Uh, and so they actually banned together uh, a, a large amount of funds and hire a lawyer to sue to the state Supreme Court, which the state Supreme Court rules that this is violating uh, their civil rights because this was not uniformly applied. Had the city applied these protocols to all members of the population, they could have reasonably argued that this was for public safety and public health. But because they were discriminatory with it, that was the problem. And so that exacerbates the distrust in the community if they're willing to engage in that. Another problem that can emerge with public health is if there's competing narratives uh, between politicians and public health officials, or if public health officials seem too heavily swayed by politicians. Uh, that can create distrust. Another thing that can dis create distrust is confusion. Uh, so if there's a lot of back and forth uh, in decision making, that can exacerbate distrust. So public health has to be very, very careful historically in how it presents things to the public uh, in terms of policy and how it words them. It has to be very careful. So for example, recently lifting the mask mandate. There's some nuance to that that most folks seem to be ignoring, right? Uh, the CDC had implied, yes, you can lift mask mandates, but only if hospitalizations and deaths are lower uh, in your community. But we're not wearing masks in here. There's no mandate in here, right? But few of us are, right? Uh, my county in California, the rest of California is fine. Kern County, not so much. It has a high amount of hospitalizations and deaths. Very few people are wearing masks. Uh, and so it's, it's a very, uh, the other issue is how the community interprets the guidelines from public health can also create distrust because uh, it starts to spin into a life of its own. So constant game of whack-a-mole. Uh, like oh, yes. Sorry, I'll need my classes for this and then I'll get the gentleman in the back. So the question is, I'm interested in the CDC. You commented Emory geographically close to CDC. Did you have any relationship with CDC? Nowadays, I wonder about the validity of CDC as pertains to COVID pandemic and what appears to be missteps. Any comments? Uh, so I did develop a relationship with some folks who worked at the CDC uh, while I lived in Atlanta, met for coffee with them a few times, uh, got a couple of tours. Um, that's about the extent of it. We started spitballing ideas about research I was thinking about in the history of tropical medicine and mitigation there. Um, as far as the validity of the CDC, it's definitely taken a knock in recent years because of 
the perception that it's unduly influenced by politics right now. And that's really hurting it at the moment. Um, the other problem is um, sometimes specialists need to learn to talk to non-specialists. And that's been a real problem. Uh, it's not that the information is bad, the information is all good, but it doesn't necessarily meet the community where it's at at understanding uh, the nuances that need to be approached with the advice, right? Um, yeah, so there, there's not an easy answer to that question, um, but there's always room for improvement with public health to learn from its mistakes and also for politicians to learn from theirs. So I saw one in the back earlier before the one on the chat, and then I'll come down here in the front and then over here. Uh, in the back, sir. Yeah, not so much a question, it's just more kind of a statement, really. Um, I appreciate your chat in a very personal way. Uh, I was living in Laos when COVID hit. I got repatriated to the state in the pandemic. When COVID was starting to spread throughout Southeast Asia, it was the white disease, it was the Western disease, it was the Quran disease. Because only Westerners, Europeans, and Americans had it. The local population didn't have it yet. Um, I just found it interesting kind of connecting that to your presentation. Yeah. <coughs> uh, yeah, so different communities are going to have different perceptions of what the origin point is, right? Uh, and they're going to use that in their discourse and their language as well. Uh, yeah. So that's something that's going to crop up. Um, it's not necessarily an indication of uh, this not being a problem just because it exists everywhere and it has conflicting statements. It's still a problem. Right, those two don't cancel each other out. They're just different problems in different communities with the same types of stereotyping going on and the same consequences playing out. So it's it's good to observe those when they emerge, just like in the case with with Haiti, where we start to see that back and forth dialogue. Sherry, I'm wondering if there's um, a difference in perception of what is how do we prevent this from happening? Like I, you know, with COVID, things move so fast that there and all this information, scientists are trying to come up with information, CDC is trying to come up with information, everybody's working on this, and they're trying to let get that information out as quickly as possible. And so it's not a surprise that stuff isn't peer reviewed, it's not a surprise that information changes. Right. Um, they learn something and it's not a surprise given human sadness, <laughs> you know, the way we how we like to blame others for things. So it's not a surprise that all that happens, but how do we, I mean, what do we learn from the fact that this has happened again and again and again and again? How do we prevent it from happening? That's that's a great question. So the question is, how do we prevent this having such a massive impact when something like this occurs that creates these situations where we have to rely on incomplete advice and things like that? Um, one answer to that actually came up in the discussion earlier with students at WSU, uh, is we do have this tendency to look for a technical solution to the problem. We need a scientific solution to the problem, right? Uh, a panacea that's gonna fix it all, right? Um, when one of the things that would really help alleviate uh, the disparities is addressing the larger systemic underlying problems in the society so that you don't get those differential outcomes. And what I talked to the students earlier this afternoon was about the early mission of the World Health Organization when it's founded in 1946, its aim is to establish health as a universal human right by addressing systemic concerns with health infrastructure, mental health, and nutrition across the globe, which is a big ask, right? And so over time, this major debate emerges in global health that had been dragging on for a century and change before between the address the societal underlying concerns or do the targeted disease-centered approach with whack-a-mole every time something pops up and find the solution, contain it, move on. 
There were cost benefit analyses saying, well, that's cheaper, more effective, even though you have to do it more regularly. Whereas the underlying conditions are what makes it so dramatic each time it emerges. Um, but unfortunately, once we get our, our technical golden goose, we kind of just run with it and let it go. Uh, to quote Jesse Spunholtz, talking about those technical solutions, right? In our conversation with students. Um, so one of the better ways is to address the societal underlying issues to mitigate those disparities. Over here and then up front. Okay, so basically the gist of the question for people in Zoom world is, is there precedent in history for disinformation campaigns? Big resounding yes. Uh, lots of it everywhere. Um, so you get a lot of uh, information that poo-poo's the science on a regular basis, or poo-poo's the response, or poo-poo's people who are concerned about the disease, or poo-poo's vaccine. Anti-vax sentiments are not new. They've been around for a long time. So anybody was surprised that anti-vax would be around, didn't read a history book. Uh, this, is, this is ongoing and a lot of it's based on disinformation uh, throughout the years. Uh, and that, you get some of that in political cartoons about the earliest smallpox, inoc smallpox inoculations uh, with Yenner, right? You get these political cartoons where people are sprouting cow horns. Uh, and all sorts of conspiracy theories that this somehow bridges into bestiality if you get this vaccine that has some sort of cow serum in it. Um, so this is not new. Uh, it didn't take the form of podcasts in the past. It moved a little bit slower, but it's still there. Uh, and it's an ongoing problem. And it's something that needs to be addressed each time by responsible public health and government officials to prevent it from causing uh, major public health problems in the community. But yeah, a lot of examples. Uh, Last one. All right. So what about in the same scientific world? We've seen a move to hate people more recently in one of our forums to share any questions. Uh, and I'd imagine we have to know that we have to live in a time to not see these questions. Uh, so the question is, uh, even before science, do we have this sort of unrational attitude towards societal response? And the answer is, is yes. In the, the pre-modern period with religious responses to disease, you still get a lot of this irrational pushback. Sometimes religion itself fostering that sentiment, uh, like in the case of the second pandemic of plague in Europe with groups like the flagellants accusing Jews of spreading the disease. And it creates this massive amount of discrimination, even though the Pope at the time is issuing edicts saying, no, this is not the case. Uh, you've got this, this tension uh, against that authority and still this discriminatory practice. So the underlying issue is not the, the pushback against the science so much as the already existing inequalities in society. Exactly. Uh, and so if there is a community that's disenfranchised, or relegated to a lower tier in society, they frequently get blamed for the disease or have worse outcomes from a pandemic illness. So it's not just limited to the scientific era uh, by a long shot. This is a long running problem. It's a great question and important to remember the early modern stuff. So thank you all. Uh, thank you for coming tonight.
right, thank you so much, Dr. Wendy. Thank you for showing up here in the computer and at the Kenworthy. Again, we wanna thank the Idaho Humanities Council and Washington State University. And uh, thank all of you for showing up. Um, we really appreciate you guys coming to this. Uh, Hopefully the Lake Talk County Historical Society will continue to have our events in the spring and summer coming up. So keep an eye out for all of that. And uh, everyone have a good evening. Thank you, Dr. Wendy.